Hello, my name is Eric Brockbank, and this is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2020 meeting of the Cognitive Science Society. I'll be presenting recent work on recursive adversarial reasoning in the rock, paper, scissors game. So let's start with the observation that in many everyday scenarios, human conflict and coordination relies on our ability to reason about and predict the behavior of others. So if you're one of these lucky people moving a sofa, getting it in the door requires knowing what the other person will do next to accomplish your shared goal. Traditionally, psychologists study this using theory of mind. The idea is that people predict others' actions by attributing goals, beliefs, and desires to them. But this isn't the only way that we can anticipate other people's behavior. In many cases, past interactions provide a clue about how people will act in the future. So your dog knows that if you tend to spill food while eating, it should hang around near the table. The idea is that these two modes of reasoning about others vary in terms of how much we refer to people's cognitive states or their prior actions to predict their behavior. So we can think about these as lying on a continuum, with reasoning based on mental state attribution at one end and reasoning based on past behavior at the other. For the remainder of the talk, I'll refer to these as a cognitivist theory of mind and a behaviorist theory of mind, where a cognitivist theory of mind predicts others by attributing mental states to them, and a behaviorist theory of mind predicts others based on their past actions. Lots of previous work in psychology has examined the cognitivist theory of mind, but comparatively little has looked at the degree to which we learn about others based on just their previous actions. So in this work, we ask how people perform this behaviorist theory of mind reasoning. In other words, how do people use the past behavior of others to predict their future actions? We explore this question in a setting that's ideally suited to understanding how people learn from the previous actions of others. And that's the children's game of rock, paper, scissors. There are two primary reasons why the rock, paper, scissors game is an ideal venue for exploring this question. First, there's no expertise in this game. So people's performance is really based on their ability to make decisions within the immediate context of the game. And second, because there's no optimal move for a player in any given round, there's not much benefit to a cognitivist theory of mind here. Reasoning backwards from an opponent's goal of winning doesn't get you any closer to predicting their next move. Instead, winning over repeated interactions is a result of learning from patterns in an opponent's previous moves, or using our behaviorist theory of mind. So in our first experiment, Participants were paired up in dyads on lab computers and played 300 rounds of rock, paper, scissors against their opponent. We had 58 dyads in total. Here's what participants saw during the experiment. At top left, participants had 10 seconds to choose a move each round. And at top right, when both players had chosen, the results were displayed before moving on to the next round. So first we ask, do people show evidence of exploiting their opponents? In other words, can people use their behaviorist theory of mind here? The way we look at this is by examining win count differentials in each dyad. So we take the absolute value of the difference between each player's number of wins over 300 rounds. So if I won 120 times and my opponent won 80, and we tied the rest, we have a win count differential of 40. We compare the distribution of these empirical win count differentials in our dyads to a simulated distribution that shows what we would expect if people were playing randomly. So if people are successfully exploiting their opponents, we would expect more dyads to have high win count differentials compared to the simulated distribution. And that's exactly what we find. Our empirical data is shown in purple, and our simulated win count differentials are the green distribution. And you can see that the empirical data has significantly higher win count differentials. So we find that participants are exploiting their opponents far more than would be expected if they were playing randomly. So next we ask, how might participants be exploiting their opponents? Our first hypothesis is that participants might be transiently adapting to their opponent's move choices over short stretches during the 300 rounds. So for example, maybe I realize the sort of dependency or strategy my opponent is exhibiting and manage to win for several rounds by taking advantage of the pattern before my opponent realizes what's happening and changes her move process. As people begin to exploit their opponents, their opponents adapt, and so on. If participants were transiently exploiting dependencies in their opponents in this way, we would expect them to win in streaks you'd be more likely to win in the next round if you'd won the previous round. So to test this, we look at the autocorrelation of game outcomes in each of our dyads, looking back over increasing numbers of rounds. So if people are winning by exploiting transient dependencies in their opponent's move choices, we expect this autocorrelation to be higher. In fact, there's very little evidence of this in our data. So here, each green dot is one of the dyads, and the blue is the average across dyads. The dashed lines indicate significance thresholds. You can see that the autocorrelation is mostly distributed around zero. So participants don't appear to be achieving high win count differentials just by detecting transient dependencies in their opponent's move choices. Instead, 
it seems likely that they're exploiting more stable dependencies exhibited by their opponents over the course of the game. So then we ask, what kinds of stable patterns in people's behavior could their opponents be exploiting? To get at this question, we look at sequential regularities in people's move choices over the course of the 300 rounds. So first, we show the same distribution of empirical win count differentials from earlier, alongside the mean of our simulated results. These provide a comparison point for the level of exploitability that people show through various stable patterns in their move choices, which their opponents might plausibly exploit. In the remainder of the chart, we look at a number of different dependencies people exhibit in their move choices. This first one, for example, looks at people's overall rate of choosing rock, paper, and scissors. So if you tend to choose rock more often, your opponent might notice that and choose paper more often. To get a sense of the degree to which people's actual move choices were exploitable in this way, we plot the expected win count differential that a hypothetical opponent would achieve by maximizing against this dependency. So if you choose rock more often, an opponent maximizes against this dependency by only choosing paper. Then we plot the expected win count differential from exploiting the dependency in this way. So the higher the expected win count differential on Y for a given dependency, the more participants exhibited that dependency in their move choices. So we calculated the expected win count differential in our empirical data for all of the dependencies shown on X here. Without getting into the details, these other dependencies are based on various combinations of people's previous moves, their opponent's previous moves, and the preceding outcomes. And they increase in complexity as we move to the right. So the question we ask here is, how do different combinations of previous moves and outcomes influence people's move choices? So here's the data. Again, higher expected win count differentials for a given dependency signal that people are exhibiting that dependency more in their move choices. So the first finding is that people show a great deal of exploitability over increasingly complex dependencies. Second, this data suggests that participants' previous choices, their opponents' previous choices, and the previous outcomes all impact people's move decisions in ways that make them exploitable over the course of 300 rounds. So the key takeaway is that any number or combination of these dependencies might form the basis for the actual win count differentials that we see in our experimental diodes on the left. So to bring it all together, we first showed in this experiment that in repeated interactions, people show clear evidence of exploiting stable dependencies in their opponents' move choices. And the data further suggests that among our experimental dyads, people exhibit a range of different dependencies or regularities in their move choices that their opponents might plausibly have used as the basis for exploiting them. So this raises a question, which is, what dependencies were people actually using to exploit their opponents? Or more broadly, what dependencies are people able to detect and exploit against a stable opponent? So we addressed this question in experiment two. This experiment was identical to experiment one, except this time people were paired with a bot opponent. So each of the bot opponents in experiment two belonged to one of the seven strategies shown on the left, and that determined how they chose their moves. These strategies were selected in part based on the dependencies that participants themselves exhibited in experiment one, which we just looked at. So bot choices always favored a particular transition from a prior move to the next move. The table at the right shows what we mean by transition here. Given its own previous move or its opponent's previous move, the bot's next move will most likely be a positive, negative, or stay transition. That's the plus, minus, and zero in the table. So in the first four strategies, the bot was most likely to choose a particular transition each round based on either its own previous move or its opponent's previous move. The graphic in blue here illustrates this preference for a positive transition each round, again, from either its own previous move or its opponent's previous move. For the next two strategies, the bots favored a particular transition that varied across different previous outcomes. So the green table at the right illustrates a bot that shifts up from its previous move after a win and down after a loss, rather than always shifting up or down from its previous move. And in the final strategy, the bot chose a move each round by favoring a particular transition depending on each previous outcome and the transition it made in the previous round. So the top left shaded square in the graphic on the right shows that the bot shifts up after each round in which it had previously shifted up and won. So at a high level, these bot strategies are parametrically increasing the complexity of the dependencies that people need to detect in order to exploit the bot and reliably beat it over 300 rounds. And this allows us to examine the range of behavioral dependencies that people can reliably detect and exploit. So how did participants do against their bot opponents? The way we analyze this is by looking at the average win count differential against each of the bot strategies that participants were paired with. So the dashed line indicates chance performance, and the higher the win count differential on Y, the more participants were able to detect and exploit that strategy. So this is what we find. 
you can see that people did really well against the transition strategies on the left in blue. Against the more complex outcome dependent strategies in green, people still showed some evidence of detecting the strategy, but not nearly as well. And then people basically performed a chance against the most complex strategy in yellow. So we find that these strategies represent a range of dependencies that people are able to exploit maximally, partially, and not at all. And this reveals limits in our behaviorist theory of mind. So we show the kinds of patterns people can readily detect and exploit and the point at which they can no longer do so. So the next thing we do is try to better understand people's behaviorist theory of mind reasoning here by looking at the trajectory of their learning against each strategy. So we bin the 300 rounds of each experiment into sets of 30 on X and calculate people's average win percentage against each bot in each block of trials on Y. So for the bots people were able to exploit, we expect the win rates to go up as people figured out what their opponent's strategy was. And that's more or less what we see here. So the red line is chance, and we can see approximately when people started to figure out each bot strategy. So interestingly, the outcome-based strategies take about 200 rounds for participants to learn, while the simpler transition-based strategies are detected pretty much immediately. So there's some kind of learning process here that's allowing people to figure out these strategies on different time scales and to varying degrees depending on their complexity. So next we wanna understand what's underlying those different levels of exploitation. Here, we're examining how thoroughly people were able to detect the bot strategy. In other words, did they get the whole thing or just particular aspects of it? So for each of the bot strategies, we look at the win percentage on Y, but we split it out across the different events that form the basis of the bot strategy. So for the bots that choose a particular transition based on their own previous move, shown here, we look at people's win percentage against those bots given each previous move by the bot. Similarly for the other strategies, we plot participants' win percentage given either the bot's opponent's previous move in that middle column, or for the outcome-based strategies on the right, given the previous outcome. So what we expect on these graphs is that the more similar the win percentage is when it's split across these different dependent events, the more people were learning the full strategy. So here's what we see. Not surprisingly, people performed well against the transition-based strategies in the first two columns, no matter the previous move or opponent previous move. However, for the outcome-based strategies in the far right column, people seem to have achieved higher than chance win percentages primarily by figuring out how to beat the bot after a tie, much more than the other outcomes. So people successfully exploit the full scope of the transition dependencies, but only individual components of the outcome-based dependencies. This is interesting because it tells us a little bit about how people deploy their behaviorist theory of mind across the range of strategies here. It suggests that people use a limited set of tools for learning pattern opponent behavior. Against more complex strategies, this allows them to pick up individual parts of the dependency structure, but not necessarily to learn the full strategy. So to bring everything together, in experiment one, we showed that people are able to use their behaviorist theory of mind in adversarial settings. Specifically, people showed clear evidence of exploiting their opponents, likely based on a range of stable dependencies and their opponents' move choices. And in experiment two, we showed that there are clear limitations of using a behaviorist theory of mind. Intriguingly, this suggests that our success at predicting others in different social scenarios may be driven more by our cognitivist theory of mind. In support of this, we showed that people are able to exploit different opponent behaviors maximally, partially, and not at all, with only selective exploitation of these more complex strategies. So our next steps are first to fit different learning models to the human bot data from experiment two. This will allow us to explore interesting questions like, what information people might be using to detect different opponent strategies. Looking farther ahead, we'd like to understand how this behaviorist theory of mind develops in younger children, and whether they show any of the same behavioral patterns that we see in the present experiments. And finally, we plan to investigate how our behaviorist theory of mind interacts with our more abstract cognitivist theory of mind. The goal of this is eventually to understand the precise mechanisms by which people develop rich predictive models of other people's behavior in diverse settings. So with that, I wanna thank my advisor and co-author Ed Vool for supporting this research, as well as everyone in the Computational Cognition Lab at UCSD for lots of helpful feedback along the way. And thank you for listening.